Bless you. Peace and blessings. Back. Can your be Thank you, Lord. Peace and blessings, everyone. <clears throat> I can't get used to this side view. I'm sorry. I just can't do it. I know my sister's going to be upset with me. I'm gonna have to get a camera or something. But until then, peace and blessings, everyone. <clears throat> I hope everyone is enjoying their day, enjoying their Sunday. I hope that you're not working too hard, that you're able to rest this day. I pray that, um, and I believe that, because God made this day, and God made this day with the intention that you would rejoice and be glad in it. So I hope and I also believe that joy was a part of your day. And even if you face difficulties and hardships, even if the enemy or people presented challenges before you that you were able to apply James chapter 1 and count it all joy because... When God gives us joy and we're able to count it joy, then something happens on the inside. Joy produces something on the inside and joy produces divine strength. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. It doesn't say that the joy of the Lord is strength or it doesn't say that the joy of the Lord is their strength. So the joy is something unique that God gives to those that he's called according to his purpose, to those that believe in him and believe in his son, and those that trust in him with all their heart. One of the God is a rewarder, and one of the rewards from God is joy and joy unspeakable that comes from the Holy Ghost. So I pray and trust that everyone is doing well. <clears throat> I just wanted to share a couple of things. You know, God been putting some wonderful things on my heart. And it's no marvel there because we serve a wonderful God. So it, it should be expected that wonderful things would um, come out of his bosom. <clears throat> but I wanted to share just a quick thought. You know, you're not as dirty 
as you think. And I'm going to be reading from John chapter 13. But before I do that, join in me with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you, Lord, for who you are. Truly, there is none like you, none beside you, none other than you. To you, we bestow all honor, glory, and praise. For above all, you are worthy of it. We thank you, Lord God, for the moments that you have created in our lives where you chose to step into our world. We bless you for it, Lord God. We thank you for the memories, Lord, that you have created in our hearts, Lord God, that when the going gets tough, Lord, we can always revert back to the wonderful works that you've done in our lives and celebrate you for it, Lord God, no matter what's going on. So we bless you. We bless your son, Jesus. We thank you and we're grateful for the Holy Spirit. We ask that you would have the preeminence right now, Father. I speak peace over this line, God. Uh, let there be, let this be a confusion absent zone in the name of Jesus. But every person that you design to connect to my voice, Lord God, let this wisdom be easily entreated. Let it be sown on the softest soil of their heart, Father. Anoint their ears to be able to hear what the Spirit speak, Lord God. Give understanding, knowledge, and wisdom and revelation, Lord God, concerning our lives and the situations that we find ourselves in. But I ask, Lord God, that if there's anyone suffering, Lord God, feeling ashamed, depressed, downcast, and especially condemned, I pray, Father, that this lesson and this prayer will be aimed at condemnation to break apart the bars, Lord God, of iron called condemnation, Father, to destroy the yoke of condemnation and fear so that your people can be free to move forward in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love this hat. <clears throat> I love wearing this hat. I mean, obviously, because it got the cross on there. And I think it fit my hat, very, my head very well. But I also love this hat because it's one of my favorite hat because uh, Brother Joe bought it for me. So thank you, brother, if you're listening. I appreciate you buying this hat for me. <clears throat> so John chapter 13. Okay. Now I'm going to start at verse 1. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then comes he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. Jesus said unto him, 
He that is washed need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every week, every wit. And you are clean, but not all. <clears throat> I like to present to you the thought that you're not as dirty as you think. Oftentimes, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Without question, without question, every person that has ever existed, ever, on the face of the earth, excluding Jesus Christ himself, have disobeyed the commandment of God in some way or another. All of us. So all of us are in need to be cleansed from sin, from the wages of sin, from the effect of sin, from the spirits that take advantage of us because of sin. We are all in need of cleansing in our lives. One, one attribute um, that's important to the ministry of Jesus is washing is cleansing. Oftentimes, Jesus spoke about cleansing. You know, he talked about having a clean heart. He talked about having clean hands, or the Bible for that matter. The Bible speaks about having a clean conscience. The Bible talks about having a clean spirit and clean flesh. The Bible even says in Galatians, when it talks about the works of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit, it lists uncleanness as a work of the flesh. Some might argue that there's no scripture in the Bible that quotes and said cleanliness is next to godliness. Some might actually argue that that isn't in the Bible. But... Though it, may, though it may not be in the Bible word for word, as we un read and understand the language of the Bible, we understand that the entire Bible is about God cleansing us. Like Peter in this situation, you know, in his encounter with Jesus, Jesus desired to wash them. The reason that he wanted to wash them, he wanted to wash their feet. Now, in that time, they didn't have Air Jordans and Timberlands and, you know, they didn't have the shoes that we have today. Their shoes, a lot of times, uh, um, left their feet exposed, sandals. Not only did they have the footwear that we have the, today, but they didn't have... Um, What's the word? They didn't have the, um, they didn't have like the trash systems that we have today, where you go put your trash on the side of the curb and the garbage man come pick it up. They didn't have those things, like, you know, they didn't have vehicles where the fuel was inside the vehicle, and the car and vehicles were designed for low admission, like. To where they don't put a lot of pollution in the air. They didn't have those things. So oftentimes, an individual walking down the road with an open toe sandal might step in something that was left behind by a mode of transportation named an animal or a donkey. You know, oftentimes it is it's plausible that it's easy to step in the pile of poop. You understand? And not only stepping in a pile of poop, just walking down a dirt path with an open toe sandal, we can surmise that dirt would get in between the toes, in between the nails, under the foot, between a sandal. And then you come into someone's house where they have some type of rug or garment laid on the floor and you have to take your shoes off. You know, that could be a mess. You trapping, you tracking Winnie the Pooh and everything else throughout the house or throughout the tent 
or throughout whatever type of abode that you entered into. So it was common practice that one of the servants of the house, or what we, we, what we were likened to as a maid, Lazarus, Lazarus, Lazarus. Yeah. You're too loud, son. So, you know, one of the, the maids or one of the servants, you know, one of their responsibility was to actually wash the feet of, and it was a form of hospitality, to wash the feet or provide um, resources in which individuals can wash their feet, you know, when they come to someone's house. Jesus humbled himself and took upon the form of a servant because he understood how important it is for his disciples to be clean. You know, he understood the importance it, it, it is, how important it is for his disciples to be clean, for their feet to be clean. You know, they will have to walk on these feet. They will have to travel on these feet, you know? So he wanted their feet to be clean. So he took the responsibility of himself to clean them. Isn't it interesting that in this story, Peter didn't think that it was appropriate for Jesus to cleanse him. Let's start right there and talk about that because oftentimes in our lives as believers, you know, we, we, our eyes, we're not conscious of the fact that we're in need of cleaning in certain areas. Like sometimes without God or the Holy Spirit pointing things out to us, we don't even realize that 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 is a dirty area or in need of cleaning. Peter wasn't aware of how important the cleaning is. The cleaning was for him. Excuse me, I'm stumbling over my words. And sometimes we're like that. But we see as the dialogue went on, you know, Jesus was just encouraging him that what? The purpose of the cleaning. He said, listen, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. This is how important it is to be clean before God. It says in the book of James that we should, we should have a clean heart and clean hands. It said, cleanse your heart, all you sinners, and cleanse your hands. You know, the Bible says, who will ascend into the north except him that is of a clean heart and clean hands? So being clean before God is important for our extension or for us to rise up into new dimensions with God and new measures of faith, or to even walk close with Jesus, being clean. Now, I just wanted to share that because these things is touched upon in the story. But what I really want to focus on is the fact of when Jesus, when Peter realized that there was some uncleanness about him, that Jesus desired to clean, he took it to a whole nother level, like, Jesus said, I want to cleanse your feet. So Peter, and, you know, Peter like, man, you don't got to clean me. I'm good. Jesus is like, no, you need me to clean you. Because if I don't clean you, you don't have any part in me. Once that, once that dawned on Peter, Peter was like, wash all of me. My hands, my feet, my mind, everything. Like. And sometimes that's our response. You know? Sometimes... <laughs> Sometimes that can be a false, a, a false humility. We like, God, just cleanse me. I'm so dirty. Just cleanse me. And, you know, we just crying out to God to be cleansed. But sometimes that's a false humility because you think that in your crying out, you're going to have more of God like Peter did. Once, once Jesus told him, if I cleanse you, then you can have a part of me. Then he wanted to go over and above. God, cleanse everything. Cleanse my everything. Jesus like, that's unnecessary. Like, I don't need everything about you isn't dirty. Like, everything about you isn't dirty. You're not as dirty as you think. Like, you know, God start to minister about maybe some sin in your life. Maybe some character defect that he wants to work on. Maybe some unresolved conflicts within your heart. Maybe a stronghold or some dark um, demonic influence in your life that Jesus wants to deal with. And as we come into the illumination that we have some issues that Jesus wants to work on, 
sometimes we just go too far with the comedy, like, you know? And then we start to condemn ourselves. We start to be so conscious of our sin and our shortcoming and our uncleanness that we start to walk in condemnation. We start to walk in an unworthy manner. We start to look at ourselves and um, become vain in our imagination. We start to think of ourselves as being so unworthy of what Jesus did for us and the purpose that God had for us. Our prayers change. They're not bold and confident. You know, we start, we start going from praying, God, it will happen in the name of Jesus to God. If you want it to happen, then let it happen. Our prayers lack boldness. They lack confidence. It's difficult for us to stand on a word. It's difficult for us to minister effectively because we're so conscious of our uncleanness. Then we really start acting up in strongholds and defending and protecting ourselves because we don't want everybody to see our weakness and our vulnerabilities and our uncleanness. So we go to great efforts to justify ourselves and cover it up. You know, then we're dealing with images because we, we're so conscious of how we look in other people's eyes. And it just goes on and on. But I believe that Jesus wants somebody to know that you're not as dirty as you think you are. Like, yes, you might have a sin issue that the Lord wants to work on, but it's just that. It's something for the Lord to work on. Yes, you may have a stronghold or two that the Lord wants to work on, but it's just that. Something that the Lord wants to work on. We start defining ourselves by our strong, whatever stronghold is present in our life or whatever sin that is present in our life. We say, oh, I'm a liar because I lied, you know. I'm a thief because I thief. But the Lord may want someone to know that you, you, you are not who, what you do, but you are who you are by the grace of God. You know, God isn't defining you by your, by a sin or action that you do, but he's actually defining you by what Jesus did for you on the cross. So be, by grace, by what Jesus has done for us, God says you're a son and not a sinner. By grace and what Jesus has done for us, God says you're a priest and not a thief. You're a king and not a vagabond. So we look, we see, we see defects in our life and things that need work. And we like, oh God, I'm so unworthy. I'm so unclean. 